Okay, we are good to go. All right, so I will call this meeting to order at 4.01 p.m. Uh, on the 20th of January, 2021 for roll call. Um, would you like me to go ahead and do that for you? That would be nice. Okay. Um, Eli Stanchu, Jr. Present. Myra Campa. Here. Savannah Rose Walker is not present at this time. Joshua Pinato. Here. And Audrey Reeves will be excused for this meeting. City Administrator Mike Rosatilla will be shortly here. And Chief Troy Tamaris is attending with us today. And then myself, Deputy Kirk Holm. All right, so the next piece on our agenda is to approve the agenda for our last meeting on, uh, no, excuse me, excuse me. The next piece on the agenda is to approve the this agenda for today. Do you have a motion to approve the agenda? All motion to approve the agenda. Do I have a second? I second. I have a second. Uh, all those in favor, uh, raise their hands or say aye. The motion pass. The next piece on our agenda is to now approve the minutes for our last meeting on. So, oh. sorry, <laughs> that um, the minutes, the agenda are included in the consent agenda. So okay. you just approve the consent agenda and that takes care of everything in that category. All right. Is that? include this next piece on the, yeah, all right. Does that include this next piece on the parliamentary procedure? Um, so if you're looking at the agenda that I just shared on the screen, it um, the consent agenda approves 2.01, 2.02 and 2.03. All right, thank you. So All then right. the next thing would be the reports. The next thing on the agenda is reports. Uh, 501 policing body cams, eight can't wait uh, with Chief Tamara, Tamaris. Might have said that wrong, sorry. Very would close. you like to share your screen, Chief? I would, thanks. Okay. All right. All right, can you all see that? We cannot. Huh. Oh, I'm so sorry. Try it again. Now? We're not seeing anything. All right, let me. How's that? There we go. Right on. You can see that. OK. Uh, let me see here, get the presentation started. You can still see it? We can. All right. Um, so, hey guys, uh, thanks for being here. Uh, this, I think I've spoken to this uh, group a couple times. These are all new faces to me. So welcome to the Youth, uh, Youth Advisory uh, Board. I think it's great that you're participating in, in uh, this and uh, benefiting the community. And uh, that's great. So um, our city administrators asked me to give a presentation similar to what I gave to the, our diversity and inclusion board. Um, I've made a couple changes to it. Um, so if you've gone on YouTube and watched that presentation, it's going to be very similar to that. 
uh, but let's get started. So I'll kind of give you an overview of the police department and uh, we'll talk about some of the uh, social uh, injustice concerns and how that might affect your community and your police department, okay? And at any time, if you have a question, just don't hesitate to unmute yourself. Uh, try to make it as uh, casual as possible. And uh, I'm happy to answer your questions as we go, okay? So this is just a quick look at uh, our organizational chart here. We actually have 18 employees and then one reserve officer. So really 19 uh, people who work for the department. 15 of us are commissioned police officers. That includes myself. And then I have support staff. I have a, uh, a special enforcement officer who uh, handles parking enforcement, uh, uh, code enforcement violations, and animal control calls. He also helps us with our evidence. He's our evidence custodian. And then I've got three clerks. So, um, and we have a new officer who just started here uh, a week ago, and um, he, he will uh, be training in. Uh, be done and he's already been through the academy so he'll be doing his field training uh starting in a month and then he'll be commissioned in may so we're pretty excited for that to come on board um i'm going to talk a little bit about our mission vision values and goals our mission of the college place police department it embraces the philosophy of community oriented policing and strives to enhance the quality of life and safety of our citizens with the highest degree of ethical behavior fairness and professional conduct our vision is to ensure that the city of College Place is a safe place to live, work, and do business through the delivery of quality law enforcement services. Um, our values, every member of the College Place Police Department is part of a team who inculcates courage, commitment, community, and character in their daily operations through the open and honest cooperation, uh, service, respect, and diversity. I'm gonna break down each one of those C's, courage, commitment, community, and character. Those are, I call them our four C's, and uh, that's what we're about here at the College Place Police Department. We do have goals, um, part of our operations plan. Uh, goal one is to reduce crime and improve traffic safety within our community. Goal two is to provide quality services and innovative policing strategies delivered through excellent customer service. Goal three is to provide leadership and resources to attract, retain, and foster a safe, ethical, innovative, knowledgeable, and diverse workforce. And goal four is to work collaboratively with our stakeholders to improve the quality of life within our city. All right, so it's important to have an operations plan. It's important to have goals so that we have direction for our employees and direction uh, that kind of a report card that we give back to our community. With goals, you have certain expectations. Um, I'm proud uh, this last June, the College Place Police Department, uh, for the first time in our 75 year history, became a fully accredited law enforcement agency. And um, the, so we are accredited through the uh, Washington uh, Association of Sheriffs and Police Chiefs. Um, I think it's important to know that there's only like 75. Uh, right around 75 agencies out of 250 agencies in the state of Washington that are fully accredited. So we're really proud of that. It takes a lot of work. And how you become accredited is by applying best practice, um, uh, making sure you're in compliance with your policies, not just having a policy, but also living out your policies and practicing your policies. And you have to have proofs and show and demonstrate that. And then you have an outside team of subject matter experts that come in and audit uh, your agency. So it's not just say, hey, we're accredited that we're doing these things. These are actually people from around the state that come in and inspect your, your agency to ensure that you are in compliance. And then uh, upon inspection, then they do award you your, your accreditation. So we're, you should be proud to know that um, we are accredited. And it, one of the benefits of being accredited is, is it's, it's good for the agency. It's good for the community. Um, it's good for the officers, so it's just a good thing all around for the city and everybody who lives here. Um, we are also, as of January 8th, became a fully federated, uh, 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 became a certified federal law enforcement agency, uh, meeting all the requirements under presidential order under the Safe Policing for Safe Communities Act. Um, uh, a, we're an accredited law enforcement agency. Um, we have use of force policies and adhere to the applicable federal, state, and local laws. Um, and we also maintain, um, we, we prohibit certain things like chokeholds, and we'll get into more of that. 
So these are some of the requirements um, that are necessary to become a uh, federally certified agency. So we're also very proud of that. So uh, who, who, show of hands, just who have heard, who of you have heard of the eight can't wait? Have you guys all heard that through social injustice and different groups, right? Show of hands, anybody? Okay. So we're going to, we're going to get into these eight can't wait. It's the ban, the chokeholds, strangleholds, require de-escalation, require warning before shooting, requires all exhaust, all alternatives before shooting, duty to intervene, ban shooting at moving vehicles, require use of force continuums, re, uh, require comprehensive reporting. So these were, these were the eight that came out here earlier this year after the George Floyd incident. The, the civil activists are asking for these particular items in particular. So we're going to get into each one of these here. Um, the first one is ban chokeholds and strangleholds. We, we do not use chokeholds. We do ban chokeholds uh, or strangleholds. Um, however, we do train our officers to use the vascular neck restraint. Um, so here's the big difference. Although they look very similar from someone that's not trained, choke holds uh, a block airway, right? They, they choke, it's, it's, it's uh, blocking, blocking the, uh, the airway. Vascular is blocking blood flow. That, that is actually a less lethal option for our officers. And it is something that we are trained in. Um, and it, we've never used it. It's, it's a very uh, unique um, tool for our toolbox that we have. Um, it would be in a situation maybe where you are fighting uh, with someone on the ground and uh, the escalation has risen. And uh, what it does is it blocks their blood flow. Um, it's very common, you see it all the time. If anybody, MMA fans, you see it used quite a bit in the MMA. Um, it makes people uh, pass out. So, and it's just for a brief, just for a few seconds, usually just long enough for the officer to break away, get out of the fight and, and get distance. Um, like I said, we've never used VNR, um, but we do have that as an option. It does require a lot of training. We do, uh, we do receive refresher training on this technique every year. Um, number two is required de-escalation. Officers are trained in de-escalation techniques uh, from the start. So when you go to the basic academy at uh, Criminal Justice Training Center in Burien, um, you, are taught, you, you begin learning these de-escalation techniques. And um, we also, just recently, we have trained uh, one of our officers, Officer Dylan Schmick. Um, he is a certified instructor on uh, de-escalation um, techniques and uh, under the I-940 law that passed, uh, well, I guess it's been 2019, um, officers are required uh, to have additional de-escalation training every three years. Um, and something I should throw out right now too is, you know, Washington State, you may not know this, Washington State actually leads the way across the nation in a lot of these uh, topics that come up. You know, they're asking, people are asking for certain things. Well, we're already doing it. We have been doing it for a long time. So um, there may be places around the country that don't have some of these, the, these things in place, but the majority of law enforcement across the state of Washington, and really in the Pacific Northwest, has this, most of these things in place. So we're, we're really proud of that up here. Um, we're also required to have uh, yearly annual uh, crisis intervention training. Um, we get that every year as well. We have for a long time. So um, a lot of these eight can't waits have been in place here for a long time. But a lot of people don't know that. So it's, it's fun for me to have an opportunity to talk to you guys and, and notify and let you know so that when you're having conversations with your friends, you can say, hey, Chief Troy, share this with me. So that's what I'm hopeful for anyways. Uh, number three is to require warning shots before shooting. That is, that is um, one of the requests. So now we, we do not require warning shots uh, before shooting. Um, we do do, we do, uh, we give verbal warnings whenever possible. So warning, a verbal warning should precede the use of a deadly force where feasible. We do not use warning shots because we have to be accountable for every round. Um, you know, to do a warning shot and accidentally hit someone or a, a bystander uh, two blocks away that you didn't see. Um, and we have to be aware of our backstop. And there, it's, it's just very reckless and dangerous to have a warning shot. That's something you see in the movies in Hollywood. And, and it's just not a practical or a best practice or, frankly, not a safe thing to do. 
Um, number four, requires exhaust all alternatives before shooting. Absolutely. Officers are trained to exhaust all alternatives before shooting. That's the very last thing. I've been a police officer for 30 years. That is the very last thing that me or any of my officers want to ever be involved in. Um, officers have less lethal tools, such as the taser, uh, the ASP baton, the less lethal shotgun, which shoots a beanbag round, um, and a vascular neck restraint, which we talked about. We also recently ordered a 40 millimeter less lethal impact munition uh, that our supervisor will have in their cars. It's just a it, it, uh, it's it's the size of a uh, oh maybe a uh, like a handball and uh, it's just a little bit bigger than that bean bag. It has a little bit bigger pop. Um, of course, all these are considered less lethal because anytime you're uh, deploying a tool um, in in this format, uh, you inadvertently uh, could hit someone. Uh, in an area which which could could in, uh, injure someone seriously or even kill them, so we have to be really careful uh, about that. And we we spend a lot of time in that uh, training. So um, number five, duty to intervene. We do have a policy that you must intervene or intercede. And what that is, uh, I'll read the policy here. It states in part: any officer present and observing another officer using force that is clearly beyond that which is objectively reasonable under the circumstances, shall, when in a position to do so intercede to prevent the use of unreasonable force. So if I see another officer doing something that's um, inappropriate or exceeds the level of force necessary to gain compliance, it's my duty to stop that from happening. Does that make sense to everybody? So we have that policy in place and we have for a long time. Uh, number six, ban shooting at moving vehicles. This is one we don't, we, we, we don't ban shooting at other vehicles and I'll explain. We, we do recognize and we train that this is the very last alternative. Um, and I'll, let me go over the policy and we can talk a little bit about what kind of scenario that might come up with. So shots fired at or from a moving vehicle are rarely effective. Officers should move out of the path of an approaching vehicle instead of discharging the firearm at the vehicle or any of its occupants. An officer should only discharge a firearm at a moving vehicle or its occupants when the officer reasonably believes there are no other reasonable means available to avert the threat of the vehicle or if the deadly force other than the vehicle is directed at the officer or others. So a scenario where that might, we remember the, uh, the, the uh, attack a couple of years ago in France where the, uh, the terrorist had the uh, vehicle and he was running people over at that event. That, that's a scenario where you may have to fire at a moving vehicle to stop that vehicle from running people over. So that's just one scenario. And I, I try not to get into too many scenarios during different things because you can go down a rabbit hole. Um, but uh, we, we train that it's a, uh, you know, the very last alternative and there are very few instances where you would want to shoot at a vehicle, but yes, we, we, we reserve that for those really unique situations. So number seven, require use of force continuum. So, um, so what a, a use of force continuum is, is if you can imagine a triangle um, and the officer's presence is at the very bottom of that triangle. And at the very top of that triangle is deadly force. And in between the deadly force and the officer's presence is things like verbal commands and then grabbing something, uh, someone. So that's called soft hands. And then striking someone, that is called hard hands. And then deploying a less lethal tool, uh, pepper spray, ask baton, everything it escalates, escalates, escalates. And then finally you get to that point where you're using deadly force. So that's the idea. So a use of force continuum concept was developed and designed to train new officers who needed to understand uh, how things escalate. The problem is, is you could show up, you could walk around the corner and you can be confronted by someone with a gun so you're jumping immediately to use force. So it's not practical to work your way through all those different obstacles before you get to that deadly force. Does that make sense to everybody? Seeing some head nods? Okay, so that is not best practice. That is not an accredited standard. That is something used in a training environment. So, um, and that's where that came from. So, um, but we, um, we do invest heavily in training for our officers. Uh, College Place officers recorded uh, 4,653 hours in training in 2019. I'm still adding up our training hours for 2020. Um, that's an average of 332 hour, uh, hours of training per officer. 
And the state standard is 24 hours a year of training for each officer. So we far exceed that. Um, so you should be pretty happy and proud of that. We, we take great pride in our, in our training. All right, so that's the eight can't wait. Maybe I should, is there any questions about the eight can't wait? Did any, anything curious or did you learn anything new, anything unexpected? Anybody? Okay. Well, uh, body cameras, there's a big push for body cameras. So let me ask you, um, why do you think agencies haven't been more aggressively seeking body cameras? Does anybody have an idea? You're all what so your, quiet. <laughs> what are your thoughts, Josh? I'm gonna put you on the spot. What are your thoughts, Josh? Why, why don't you think more agencies don't deploy body cameras? Um, I'm, I'm really not sure. I, yeah. So there's, there's two big hurdles uh, for body cameras. And um, one is cost, extremely expensive. And the second one is public disclosure. So in our state, we have a very liberal public disclosure law. However, um, under the legislators in trying to encourage agencies to get body cameras have been more restrictive with disclosure over a video for body cameras. So for, for you to obtain video from a body camera, you have to have a business need to obtain that video. So you're either the victim, the suspect, or the attorney basically is what you're limited to, um, to receive that, or the prosecutor. Uh, to receive footage from the body camera, which is really unique um, to most other public disclosure because our state is very little public disclosure. So pretty much generally people can get anything they want from a public disclosure request, um, but not so for the body cameras. Now I'll tell you, uh, we're really excited about this. College Place Police Department has invested in body cameras. We're gonna be implementing them here this year, probably this spring, uh, we've ordered them. Uh, we have a five-year contract with the Axon Body Camera 2, which is industry's best camera. It's, it's the one that uh, most agencies are using, deploying. So for five years, it's going to cost us over $200,000 for 15 cameras. So very, very expensive. Um, and that is a big hurdle for agencies to get over. A lot of agencies can't afford that. I only have 15 officers, but like Walla Walla Police Department has 55 officers or 51 officers right in there somewhere. I'm not sure what they're sitting right now, but can you imagine how expensive that'd be a half a million dollars for them to deploy those? So it's a very expensive uh, venture for cities. And it's very difficult for small departments um, to get those done. My officers actually want them because they know that they're well-trained. They're very professional. They take pride in what they do. They care about the people in our community. And they know that those body cameras will do a couple of things. One, that will protect the officer. And secondly, it'll help with prosecution. So um, it's a good thing for our community. And uh, we're really excited for it. We really push for it. And we're grateful to the mayor, the city council, and our city administrator for making that happen for us. So it's really good stuff. Any questions over anything we talked about or I said about the body cameras? Yeah. Okay. No, but that it does make sense why the cost is was more than um, what I had thought before. It was more expensive um, than what I would think the body camera would need to be. But do you think? And maybe you don't know. I mean, this is more on the manufacturing of the camera. But do you think its expense comes more because too it's not just a normal camera? Like, if I just got a normal camera and attached it to myself, right? I think, you know, you could do that for cheaper, but is it a little more secure and a little more? Yeah, great question. Uh, so these body cameras, the, a big piece of this that's behind the scenes is the cloud uh, evidence system that it loads up to. So officers, are, officers cannot manipulate the video. The software, the video gets uploaded into a evidence.com uh, software package. Um, so you're paying for licensing, you're paying for the, the maintenance, you're paying for the storage. Um, there's a lot of hidden costs that you just, we, you know, you can go, go buy a GoPro for 400 bucks, right? And you get amazing quality video footage. Um, this has that capability, that same quality of video footage. 
Um, but it can immediately upload. It can, um, it can, uh, you can, uh, some, uh, some agencies are able to live stream and see like a supervisor can check on what the roster is doing. Like live stream through that camera and doing some really neat things that, um, some newer capabilities technology provide uh, agencies. So, or if a officer is not answering a status, a, a dispatch can go online and, and stream through that. So all that tech technology is there uh, for us to unlock if we want to spend more money. So, but uh, some, some neat stuff. Um, yeah. So that's where we're at. And we also had to hire a part-time employee just to deal with the, uh, the organization of um, the videos and, and uh, being able to deal with public disclosure and, and redacting because there's, you know, uh, innocent people can't be in a video. Uh, uh, juveniles have to be redacted. Um, so there's a lot of uh, manpower associated with that, with that, uh, that um, as well. So, yeah. Anything else? Any other questions? Great question, Elon. Okay. So, um, We'll get into bias-based and racial profiling reports. So um, what bias-based policing is, is described as the inappropriate reliance on characteristics such as race, ethnicity, national origin, religion, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, economic status, age, cultural group, disability, or affiliation with any non-criminal group as the basis for providing differing law enforcement services or enforcement. Um, we have under an RCW 43-101-410, we, I, as an agency department head, the chief of police have to conduct a bias report each year, which is a look into officer's activity and looking for outliers, um, and anything that would be, uh, give me any indication of anything that's, uh, biased, uh, by any member of my agency or as a department as a whole. And I actually take it one step further. I actually publish a report and you're welcome to go to our website and the police department and you can actually download the bias report from uh, 2019. I'll be working on 2020 when all the data and stats have all dropped, usually around late February, March is when I can start working on that, when that data is available. Um, and uh, by no means do we have any, uh, any data that would indicate any bias or racial profiling in our, in our department. So we're really proud and that's one of the reasons why I like to publish it, just to, I figure the more information people have, the more they can, I like to be transparent. And um, I think there's so many, you know, I think one of the one of the problems, one of the reasons why law enforcement have had so many problems over the last year and, and through history is we're just, we've been poor communicators. And um, I, I try to over communicate and be transparent um, in, in our community. So you, because we work for you, you see what's going on. Um, and I also take phone calls and I talk to people regularly that have questions and uh, I like to have those opportunities to teach people and kind of show them what, uh, what's happening in our community and what's happening with your police department. Um, so we meet the requirements of the RCW. Um, we do have a department policy. Um, we, we have yearly training um, and uh, we, we have these discussion topics a lot. So we also uh, have a policy for our supervisors uh, to investigate and monitor those that are under their supervision. And uh, if there's any allegations, we have a, uh, a process for internal affairs um, that we would investigate and uh, we would deal with that very swiftly if, if that were to occur here. So, and I, I like at this time to kind of like talk about what it takes to be a police officer for the College Police Police Program, but also in the state of Washington. Just really quickly, I'll just briefly, you go through a, it's, 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 it's a lot of work. So you, you take a written test and a physical test, a PT test. So uh, you take a written test, um, which is extensive and a PT test. And if you qualify point wise for those, then you go on to an oral board and the oral board will present you with situational questions, um, um, uh, 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 truthfulness questions, um, uh, biased based policing questions. We have all these things built into this, the, the interview questions. If you score well enough and are lucky to move forward, it goes to our civil service uh, board and they will score out the points. There's a lot more to this, but basically in a nutshell, they'll score out the points and the top three candidates get to come have an interview with me and then I get to pick who, out of those three, who to hire. 
Um, upon receiving a conditional job offer at this point, then they go through a polygraph, which is a lie detector. Um, and we're asking questions about their drug usage, theft, um, if, if they have any extreme views, uh, any, any, any issues with uh, uh, biasness uh, or racism, we act, all that stuff is vetted through that process. Um, if they pass the polygraph, then they move on to a psychological exam. And a psychological exam, it, again, checks for bias. They, they, it's not just about, um, are you crazy? It's also, are you a good, your temperament, are you a good fit to be a police officer and carry a gun and drive a car and represent and, and carry a badge and represent your community? So those, they're really looking for temperament as well. Um, that's a big part of it. So, um, and then after that, they, they take a medical test, uh, a physical and making sure you're healthy. And then now, uh, once you get the full conditional offer, then you still have to go through training. You have to go to the academy uh, and train a uh, 22 week academy uh, over in Burien. And uh, once you complete that, you do your field training uh, time. And that's three months of riding in a car with a, uh, a field training officer and you're learning to do the job. And then you have to perform and show that you can do the job. And that includes how you handle people, how you talk to people, how you de-escalate situations and all those, those certain metrics that you have to meet to uh, complete your training. Following the training, you uh, get to be by yourself, but then you're on probation for a year. So it's ongoing observations and uh, they're receiving evaluations every three months. And uh, so it's a very, that first two years is very difficult for young officers that uh, are starting out. So we have a lot of high expectations and we hold them accountable and there's just a lot to it. And I don't, I, it's, it's probably the toughest job uh, out there to even get And with people understood the hurdles you had to go through. And, uh, but it's, it's, it's a certain calling that people are called to this job. It's about being a part of something bigger than yourself. It's about service to your community and, and, and the people that are here, truly want to be here and they they truly have a calling to protect and serve and be peace officers and to make their community safer and better so i just want you to know that that's what we have uh, for officers in your community and it's they go through a lot so to, to even get the opportunity to wear that badge so i wanted to share a little bit about this new program that's starting up here in walla walla county uh, including the city college place it's called lead uh, which is an acronym for Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion Program. And essentially, um, we're, we're still in the early process here, and we're going to be training our officers on this on the 26th. But basically what happens is the qualifications are as an officer is dealing with a low-level misdemeanor crime or someone that they're dealing with, it maybe hasn't committed a crime, but they're on the verge of committing a crime, uh, or maybe homeless or have a, have a dependency issue, um, or even out of work and, and maybe some mental health issues, officers can refer them into this program. Um, we have a group of um, lead investigators who will uh, or be mentors and they'll actually uh, take the case and they'll be work, working alongside these individuals to help them get uh, medical help, drug treatment. Um, so they're case managers and to help kind of nudge them on and encourage them and give them some accountability. So it's a pretty cool thing that we're just kind of launching right now. So just wanted to share it with you that we're in early stages of this. We actually, Walla Walla got trained first and they actually have some referrals. I had a referral meeting this morning and it's pretty exciting and encouraging that we actually have some people that, because uh, they have to want to do it. That's part of it. They, they have to say, yeah, I want to be part of this. And that we have a, a, a good start already. So pretty exciting for our community. Um, you should also know that we have a waypoint, you know, but you hear a lot about why aren't social workers involved and doing all this stuff and why aren't social workers responding to this? Well, they do and they have for a long time. We have worked with social workers here in College Place uh, very closely for a long time. Waypoint, um, we partner with Crisis Response Team, uh, which is part of uh, Community Health. Their facility, Waypoint, is actually located here in College Place, just down from the Honda dealership over here off of 125 and in, in, uh, um, brand new building there that just opened last year. They have a 16 bed facility to help individuals struggling with mental health. Um, it, it's a voluntary facility, so you have to want to go there. It's not a jail, we don't take, we don't force people to go there. Um, 
they have crisis response team members that will um, respond to mental health crises and issues. And when we respond to them and we call for their assistance, they will come out and help us with that. And we, we enjoy that partnership. And again, um, these are some of those things that our community and around the state and the country have, are calling for, but we already have, we have these things in place and we're, we're getting better all the time. And uh, uh, of course, you know, it takes money and time and, and resources, but uh, you should know that we, we do work with social workers and we have for a while and uh, it is an important part of uh, providing service to our community. So Waypoint right here in City College Place, but they do serve the greater Walla Walla area. Um, and that's pretty much it for our, my presentation today. Does anybody have any questions? Um, I have one question. Sure. Uh, the, I think we've talked about this maybe once before, brought it up before, but the school resource officer, mm -hmm. um, I just know his first name, Joey. I think he lives down the street from me, actually. But uh, he... Um, could you explain a little more of like, because it has to do with us uh, representing our schools, right? What the school resource officers like job is. Yeah, yeah. So I know that a lot of people think that all the SRO does is he's there to prevent a tragedy from happening as in a school attack or, or he's there to make arrests for fights and things like that. That's not, that is something that certainly is a benefit that he is there to provide that protection, but he's really there to um, foster relationships with the kids, assist the staff, um, and, you know, help. Um, he's been there for four school years and uh, he's only had to physically arrest three, pe three people over that four, four school seasons. So we do everything possible to uh, mitigate and, and keep kids out of the criminal justice system. Um, uh, you know, there's been thefts where he helps get property returned. There's been bullying going on and where he's working on developing those relationships and, and trying to help educate um, the, the fellow students in, in, in how to, uh, to, to treat people better. And he's just a great resource for parents and that are concerned about their kids. Um, he is there for kids who are, um, there's, there's awful things like sex trafficking going on in our community, and that does affect our schools as well. And they could be someone sitting right next to you that you're unaware of. Um, sadly, there are, there are things that are occurring in people's homes. Um, you know, I'm sure all of you come from great families who are, are loving and supporting, and, and, uh, but there are kids who in our community that, that may not have that. And there's, there's things that are going on in their home. So, that he, the officer is a, a resource for that as well. They put the right people together and get the resources for those students to help them get help. Um, so it's a very complex, uh, multi-layered uh, job. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a good thing for the police department. It's a good thing for college place schools. And uh, it's a good thing for our, our community. So does that answer your question, Eli? Yes, thank you. Absolutely. All right, how about you, Savannah? Any questions? You're down there kind of quiet. Um, I don't have any specific questions. I like what you covered and I felt like it was very informative for us if people have questions about the College Place Police Department. So I feel like we, we can confidently um, tell them a little bit more if they're asking um, questions like that. So thank you for the presentation. Well, that's great to hear because, uh, you know, I, I, I have these discussions with people in the community and, and family members, friends, whatever. And, and there's so many, you know, law enforcement's taken a hit this last year. We kind of low hanging fruit on some of this stuff, but, you know, remember we're just the first layer of the criminal justice system. So, um, but we're the most visible layer and, um, it's, uh, it's a, it's a tough job, but, uh, I just want you to know that, um, some of the information that's been sent out there over the last year is really unfair. And I think that the more people, the more questions people have, the more they, they hear presentations like this, uh, the more informed you are, the more comfortable you are, you're going to be with what we do. Um, every contact an officer makes is recorded on, in our computer system. 
And um, it's really easy. If you run a driver's check, it's permanently recorded. If you run a registration check, it's permanently recorded. Um, we, we, uh, we're very uh, thorough in what we do and, and there are laws to protect um, our officers and the public. So we, we follow those policies and laws. So um, it's, it's good that you know that and it's good that I had the opportunity to come and talk to you guys. So if, at any time, if you guys ever wanna call me and ask me a question or email me and ask me a question, I'm always open to do it. So I'm happy to do it. Let me know. If there is no other questions, um, we will move on to the next piece of our next piece on our agenda, 5.02 CP activities input. The city would like to solicit input regarding CP activities such as the 75th anniversary celebration, farmers market, and other socially distant activities. We could have the 75th anniversary celebration combined with Freedom Festival on Sunday, June 27th, or we could add this 25th anniversary celebration to a farmer's market day. Is somebody presenting or reporting on that? Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll give it to Carol in a minute. Uh, with this uh, item, uh, just trying to get some uh, ideas for how you would like uh, to see things going on. Uh, we don't really know yet when the full extent of COVID pandemic will be over, but we do have suspicions that hopefully there could be some loosening of things as we get into the summer. Uh, so yeah, just talking through a farmer's market and originally we were going to have 75th anniversary uh, party uh, around Winterfest because uh, the incorporation date is actually uh, Christmas Eve, uh, but that didn't come and pass due to the enhanced mitigations. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Carolyn. So we're, we know we're going to have a 75th anniversary celebration um, sometime. And as Mike said, at what level? We just, we're not sure yet. We're hoping we can go all out. It would be ideal for it to be on Freedom Festival and that we can hold Freedom Festival um, because we always do fireworks. And that would just be really cool. So we were... Um, just looking for input from you guys um, to see if you have ideas or any kind of things you want to share. I know I would like to say that I think it sounds like a good idea um, to have to have it on Freedom Festival. I don't know. That just sounds like a well-suited uh, place to have it. Are there, al are there already any other suggestions for what, like, I've been to, I think, the Freedom Festivals before, but because it's the 75th anniversary, are there any ideas for what they might do to um, present that differently? So the Historic Preservation has a member who is a He's a great historian for this whole valley. Um, his name is Mike Denny. He is actually writing a book and um, it's on College Place. So from basically the um, start of it until even, I think they're gonna get up to this point in time. And so the idea was um, maybe having a book signing and then um, obviously we'll do some other things, but we're just, um, without saying anything more, we're just looking for other ideas that somebody might have um, related to that because we just, you just never know what somebody's gonna come up with. Does anyone else have ideas or suggestions? So um, 
if we were unable to hold Freedom Festival because due to COVID and because of the fact that it's harder to control traffic, what do you think about having it um, on a farmer's market day? Do you think that is something that you guys would go to? Well, actually, do you even think you would go to something like that for the city? Well, I think one thing that could be said too is it's really COVID dependent, I, I'm sure. Let's say it's restrictions are less, vaccines have been distributed more um, widely, the virus is, is, you know, quite contained by this time. You know, I'm sure that people will actually be pretty um, excited to just go do any activities that are like public activities, you know, and go with people. So I think there will be a generic like appeal to just, if you put on any celebration. Um, secondly, the one thing about doing it during a farmer's market would be is it would like, you'd already have the vendors and like the, like places for people to buy things, right? Um, buy and sell, that would already be set up, right? So, and the area would still be there, correct? So I think that would be, it'd be easier, not necessarily that that's the better, but I think with COVID restrictions, I think that might be a good second alternative. Um, there's more space and there's more uh, room, I guess. Thank you for that input. Mike, did you have anything else you wanted to say related to it? No, no, I mean, no, I mean that we're just uh, looking to either hopefully do Freedom Fest or if we can't do that, then maybe go uh, do it during Farmers Market Day. I know that in other communities for uh, some of these festivals that uh, they usually tend to do parades. The thing, the things I've noticed historically in town here is it seems it's harder to do a parade as you're getting into the summer because a lot of the students aren't here. So that's where I think we differ a bit from other communities. Uh, but I mean, if if we're able to do Freedom Fest like how we were able to a couple of years ago, uh, we had the uh, music. Uh, and basically uh, entire farmer's market like area as well as fireworks. So uh, I would hope that the restrictions uh, last thing enough as we get toward later June that we're uh, able to restore that or some semblance of uh, that. Savannah, did you want to say something? Well, I was just going to ask if you guys are looking for like other socially distant activities you can do for either one yeah well i would like to suggest i am always a fan of art walks and i find that that's kind of a fun thing to do you don't have to be close to people you can feature local artists of like spots in the town that everybody loves or the hills or the windmills and kind of something that can bring people closer together um but I don't know, that was just an idea. And I felt maybe if it's in the summertime, it would be a little easier to social distance if you have a one way in and a one way out and then you let people in just so, so just tonight. Do you, um, can you give me an example of somewhere where an art walk's been done that I can actually check out some of the information related to it? Yeah, I was going to say I'm from Bend, Oregon, and they have a lot of things either done by the city or through um, the Parks and Recreation there. Okay. Um, yeah, it's probably available on their website, and if not, I can ask some people down there if they know where it would be. Okay. That sounds great. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, so I just want to say one thing before Eli closes the meeting, the, or, um, the open public meetings act certificates, um, 
well, the training needs to be completed by all of the members of the committee and then fill out a certificate and send that in to me. So I, I'm still missing a couple of people. So if you guys could please um, go in and take that education. It's only like, I think 12 to 15 minutes um, and then complete the certificate and send it to me. So the way to get to where that information is, is um, if you go to the board docs, which is from the city of college place um, website, you just click cpwa.us and you scroll down a little bit and click board docs. And then you choose this committee, which is Youth Advisory. And if you open up this year, you'll see the handbook. And you open that up just like you're opening a meeting. And then the information is right here, um, the OPMA PRA requirement. That's where you can, um, that tells you how to get to the training. And that's where the certificate is. If you guys could please um, go ahead and do that and send me your certificate, I'd really appreciate that. That would be great. We have a little bit of bookkeeping we have to do still, so that'd be great. If there are no further questions or comments, um, we'll move on to the next piece of our agenda, which is to, to close and to adjourn. So do I have a motion to adjourn. All motion to adjourn. Do I have a second to adjourn? Second. I have a second. All those in favor of adjourning, raise your hand or say aye. I believe the motion passed. We are, this meeting is adjourned at 4.52 p.m. Um, January 20th, 2021. And then the next meeting is February 17th, Wednesday. Thank you.